Okay, so that's obviously a very, very brief uh, overview of the background, but hopefully as I talk about it's on. It's not working. Can you hear me now? No. Okay. All right. That's all right. So when, uh, not long after Jesus rose from the dead, Christians tried to think about what, what did all this mean and how do we describe it? And one of the earliest models of the atonement Was, uh, I think the kids walked away with my markers. <laughs> so like I said at the beginning, and actually Christus Victor is more like a category. All, all the different ways that Christians have thought about the atonement some of them overlap and you'll find echoes you know in one model to another but from the very beginning this was the one that emerged and pretty much dominated Christian thought for the first thousand years until say till Anselm uh, who died in like 1100 sometime in the uh, 1100 AD. So the Christus Victor, I'm going to talk about this for a while. So like I said, each model is an attempt to express how the incarnation, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus accomplished salvation. We've been looking at this up to this point from the perspective of how do I or how do we appropriate uh, the salvation uh, that has been given to us in Jesus Christ and we've been talking about it in terms of faith and what does it mean to have faith and we've obviously been looking that, at that in terms of uh, allegiance or loyalty to Jesus. So now I want to look more on the Jesus side of the equation. So <clears throat> I've given you a handout and uh, of some hymns and songs that contain various models of, of atonement. And one of the Christus Victor songs that we sing is by Darlene Zetch called The Victor's Crown. You are always fighting for us, heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your greatness, in your name I will bow down. In your presence fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill the temple, let your power overflow. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. Alleluia, you have overcome. You have overcome. Alleluia, Jesus, you have overcome the world. That phrase, by the way, comes from John. John and the epistles and Revelation, all written by John, are where many of the Christus Victor folks turn to uh, when they want to pull some scripture to say, hey, this is, this is why we're saying this or how we believe this. John, or Jesus said in John 16, 13, I have overcome the world. And here's the interesting thing about the word world in John. It can mean the world as in the earth, or all the peoples of the earth. Or it could mean the world in terms of opposition to God that goes deeper than just people, but at a spiritual level. And sometimes it may be a little bit of both. In 1 John 4, 4, you dear children are from God and have overcome them, 
because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. At the beginning of chapter 4, we learned that what he means by world are the spirits in opposition uh, to God. And they are, these spirits are working in false prophets. So the, the language of victory for, of Jesus over the world is meant to include what would we call it today? The world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the victory over all of them. Another <clears throat> example of Christus Victor is uh, Sing My Tongue, the Glorious Battle. The words coming from the 6th and 7th century. Sing my tongue the glorious battle of the mighty conflict sing. Tell the triumph of the victim to his cross thy tribute bring. Jesus Christ, the world's redeemer, from that cross now reigns as king. Thirty years among us dwelling, his appointed time fulfilled. Born for this, he meets his passion that the Savior freely willed. On the cross, the lamb is lifted where his precious blood is spilled. He endures the nails, the spitting, vinegar and spear and reed. From that holy body broken, blood and water forth proceed. Earth and stars and sky and ocean by that flood from stain are freed. There is this thread in Christus Victor of the whole of creation has been changed as a result of Jesus' death and resurrection. And that's what we're getting there in that verse. Faithful cross above all other, one and only noble tree, none in foliage, none in blossom, none in fruit, thy peer may be. Sweetest wood and sweetest iron, sweetest weight is hung on thee. Bend thy bows, O tree of glory, thy relaxing sinews bend for a while the ancient rigor that thy birth bestowed suspend, and the king of heavenly beauty gently on thy thar arms extend. Praise and honor to the Father, praise and honor to the Son, praise and honor to the Spirit, ever three and ever one, one in might and one in glory, while eternal ages run. Those are just two uh, examples of songs that have echoes of some version of, of Christus Victor. So, for what purpose did Christ come down? Well, that he might destroy sin, evil, the devil, overcome death, and give eternal life to human beings. Uh, there's a theologian by the name of Gustav Allen, uh, who's probably in our, well, not in our generation per se, but in the 20th century, uh, probably one of the definitive theologians on Christus Victor. He wrote this, the work of Christ is first and foremost a victory over the powers that hold humans in bondage, sin, death, and the devil. These may be said to be in a measure personified, but in any case, they are objective powers. And the victory of Christ creates a new situation, bringing their rule to an end and setting humans free from their dominion. Ephesians 6, 12, Paul wrote, For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What? Isn't uh, part of Christmas Victor uh, like frightening with gates of hell? Sure. Sometimes you see that in the program. Yeah, there are lots of different ways that it. Gates to the side, you just on top coming out, leaving them out. Oh yeah, I don't know about the pic I don't the particular image doesn't come to mind, but that sounds like Christus Victor. Very much so. Uh, the theologian Irenaeus from the uh, what the late second century, he was born in 130, lived to 200, 202. He's probably the first person to try to articulate in some way, in some systematic way what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And for Irenaeus, 
if you can remember way back when we were talking about this big thing called Christology, Christology plays a big part in this for Irenaeus. That is to say, the humanity of Christ and the divinity of Christ. And that's what Christology is all about. It's, it's, it's the study of how can Jesus be fully God and fully man at the, at the same time. And for Irenaeus, it's vitally important that we understand that God is fully in Jesus Christ. And in his day, one of the reasons why he started writing about this was because there were, there were competing ideas about Jesus which said, for example, that, well, Jesus maybe was more like a demigod. Maybe he, uh, like, like uh, N.T. Wright hinted at, there are, maybe there's different gods. Maybe the God of the Old Testament is this other God. And, you know, he created the world, and that's a mistake. But the father of Jesus is a whole different God. And maybe Jesus... Uh, maybe he is just so good and so wonderful that he was awarded, if you will, God's status as a result of his work. And in defense of Christian thinking, Irenaeus' book was called Against Heresies. Uh, Irenaeus said, no, God is in Jesus Christ. He wrote, the same hand of God that formed us in the beginning and forms us in our mother's womb in these latter days sought us when we were lost, gaining his lost sheep and laying them on his shoulders and bringing them back with joy to the flock of life. One of the uh, other words that are, is frequently used in association with Christus Victor which means the undoing, I'm just, this is my words, undoing of Adam's sin. That's what re recapitulation means. It's the undoing, it's the reversing of the fall. It isn't just that Jesus is a victory, is a victor. It's not just that he's now king. This fact has changed something in, in our reality. It's, ch <clears throat> it's changed our relationship with God because this has been undone. The cross and the resurrection uh, I think Irenaeus would say, points to a future that is now a certainty, that future being the, the renewal of heaven and earth. We, in the meantime, work with God, cooperate with God in his ongoing work of renewal. Questions so far? No? Nope. So we're, we're, we're just, this is just about sort of the way Christians have thought about this. We may come to our own conclusions at some point. In the first century, I mean, here's the thing. When we start asking questions like, why did Jesus die? What did it accomplish? We have to, we, we sort of have to be careful about the questions that we're asking. For example, this, the reformers, one of the questions that they were asking that they picked up from Anselm and elaborated on was how does a just and holy God deal with sin? This holy and just God has to do something with sin. Sin has to be punished, for example. But that's not the question of the first century. First century people weren't asking that question. What they were asking was, how does God become king? That's what, that's what N.T. Wright was just trying to tell us. The hope of Israel was not, oh, we're sinners and we're all going to go to hell. It was... How, when is God, and how is God going to remake the world? How is God going to come and be king? What were the barriers that would need to be removed in order 
for God to become king? And one of the answers to that question were the barriers of the evil one. The evil one who stands in the way of God and his, and his work. So they developed early on a view that somehow Christ's death and resurrection was evidence of a victory over the cosmic spiritual forces. So for example, John 12, 31. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. We also find this similar concept in chapter 14, verse 30, and chapter 16, verse 11. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 wrote, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. In Ephesians 2, he wrote, You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that's, de that's the devil, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And the scripture references along these lines go on and on and on. I mean, just go, they just go on forever. A contemporary author by the name of Gregory Boyd, <clears throat> he, are, he points out that Peter in his sermon in Acts chapter 2, his sermon hinges on a cosmic victory. This Jesus, Peter said, God raised up, and being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, he has poured out this spirit that you both see and hear. For David did not ascend to the heavens, for he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Peter then said, Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. I did not know this, but that's the most quoted verse in the New Testament. When the New Testament quotes scripture, according to Gregory Boyd, Psalm 110, verse 1 is the most quoted uh, passage in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of them, Jesus quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. So we're not surprised then to find that salvation is frequently depicted as freedom from the devil's oppression because that's what the enemies under your footstool meant putting your enemies under your feet. It wasn't just the rulers of this world, the human rulers, but the spiritual ones as well. In Acts 26, when Paul received his message from Jesus, he was told by Jesus that he was to go to the Gentiles to turn them from the power of Satan to God. In 2 Timothy, salvation is an escape from the trap of the devil. Galatians 1.4, we're rescued from the present evil age and liberated from enslavement to the spiritual forces of the world. The cosmic spiritual dimension of salvation is, is prominent then in Christus Victor. It's because the cosmos has been redeemed that we are redeemed. And this is the logic of Colossians chapter 1. And I thought I would just take the time to walk this through. Colossians 1, <clears throat> starting at verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We're being, we're, what, we're, what Paul is painting is this cosmic picture. 
of the significance of Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross, uh, through his shed blood on the cross. He hasn't even gotten to us yet. Okay? He hasn't even gotten to us yet. He set up this cosmic picture, and then he says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. The similar flow or logic is in Ephesians chapter 1 as well. The point is that the cosmos has been redeemed, or if you will, creation has been redeemed. We are creatures, therefore, if we believe in Christ, we are redeemed. No? I'm, lo I'm losing you. Okay. Hmm? I'm not sure if it follows. Huh? Now you're asking if follow Yeah. I'm not sure everybody is. And Christus Victor, uh, let me back up and say that, that the New Testament looks at the events in the, in the world as having a spiritual dimension to them, not just a, an historical one. So when the king of Babylon says to, uh, or uh, whoever, whatever, whoever was the king that let the Jews return, the Jews didn't say, the king let us, made us, let us return. God, God sent us back. God is working through the king. And in, and in a similar way, the evil things that happen, the bad things are happening, there are spiritual forces at work in, in those as well. And so this, the victory of Christ is this victory over all of it. Uh, one author, <clears throat> I, oh, James, James Callis wrote this, salvation is not simply the overcoming of my guilt, but, the salvation, but salvation is the liberation of the whole world process of which I'm only a small part. Remember when I tried to explain how one way of thinking about what Jesus has done for us is that you're in a car headed towards a cliff. Okay, and your car is going to go over the cliff. I mean, you've got enough speed, it's going to go. And there's no stopping it. You're now at the forces, uh, at the mercy of the forces of physics. But Jesus somehow takes you out of the car and he's in the car and goes over the cliff. Okay, what James Callis is saying is that from the Christus Victor point of view, we are not just sinners who rebel, we are people caught up in a tidal wave. We are people caught up in something that is even greater than ourselves. Not that we don't have any responsibility, of course we do. But there's something more sinister at work, if you will. And Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross defeated that. Now Gregory Boyd writes, hopefully this is going to make sense. 
Gregory Boyd says, once we understand the victory of Jesus on the cross for what it is, and from his point of view, Christus Victor is showing us the love of God. This is, notice that I'm not talking about punishment. I'm not talking about substitution. Okay, that's a different model for uh, what Jesus accomplished. Boyd writes, when we understand that the powers are destructive systemic forces. And when we view Jesus' life in light of Calvary, it becomes apparent that every aspect of his life was an act of spiritual warfare. For every aspect of his, of his life reflects Calvary-like love. His breaking of religious taboos, eating with tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners, healing on the Sabbath, in the light of Calvary, we can understand Jesus to be waging war against the powers and exposing the systemic evil that fuels religious legalism and oppression. Also, we see this loving warfare when Jesus crosses racial lines to Samaritans and Gentiles and other social barriers like lepers. He is seen as exposing the res and resisting the evil powers that fuel racism and social marginalization. He was conquering evil with love. This is what victory and the reign of God looks like. So that's Christus Victor. The Christus Victor model of saying, well, from the Jesus side of the equation, what did he do? What did he accomplish? And the answer is he defeated sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the, that's the simplest answer. It isn't that uh, he, uh, we're sinners in the hands of an angry God. Uh, and Jesus took the punishment instead. We're gonna, we'll get to that next. That'll be next week's, uh, we'll look at substitutionary atonement and penal substitution, which is different. It's just a, a whole different way of looking at it. Because Christus Victor doesn't really dwell all much, that much on sin at all. Okay? It's really on Jesus' has changed reality. And so it's like there's this new reality called the kingdom of God that Jesus has brought into existence. And this has affected all of creation. But you, have to, you do have to put your faith and trust in Jesus. It isn't as if, it's not like universalism. It's, the Christus Victor doesn't say that, oh, because this is true, then everyone's automatically redeemed. But the potential for redemption is there uh, for everyone. Okay. Questions? How'd I do? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you, you have a better command of church fathers than I do. I, yeah, I'd say Christmas Victor is more prevalent in the Eastern Church than in the, in the Western Church. It's more of a, a substitution because of their emphasis on uh, justice. Right. The, the Roman, they try to think about through the Roman legal view. Right. Okay. Well, there's uh, when when the class is this small, we lose some energy. I think. I don't know. Anyway, that's all I had for today. So we're, that's it. Unless you have more questions. Do you think all of these atonement theories are possible? Do you think they conflict? And then maybe there's a question for the, the end of all. Well, I, I, I think that when you, when you sort of look at all of them, and there's, there's, we're not going to look at all of them. <laughs> there are too many. Uh, there are too many, like, subtleties. 
But even if you look at the hymns, sometimes you see victory in the substitution hymn, or you see some substitution in the victory hymn, or or the last one on this is there's a there's a uh, another way of looking at the atonement called healing healing atonement. <clears throat> but if you look carefully at the, the the lyrics, there's just this echo of substitution in it as well. But the emphasis in healing is that. Uh, the death of Christ has healed our woundedness, healed, healed the scars in our lives from sin. And that's what Jesus accomplished. But I think it's all, I mean, I, th I, I, I don't think there is one theory. I don't think there's one model. Yeah, I, don't, I think it's all there. I don't, I don't think you can use one model to, to try to, it's kind of like the Trinity. <laughs> we can write and write and write and write and write about the Trinity and never exhaust it. And I think this is the same with what Jesus accomplished on the cross. There are lots of different ways of looking at it. None of them are particularly wrong or right, for that matter. Um, I think there are certain camps that like to exclude one over the other. You have to reform where it's only the substitutionary. Right, right. The exclusion of others in whom you have to do, if you have a twisted reading of scripture. I agree. Victor, but I agree. Certainly. I mean, Christus Victor, if you're only doing Christus Victor, it, I can see how that could lead to a sort of Hallmark Hall of Fame God. Right. The sentimental love. of It's just love, love, love. And, you know, and I don't see how you can exclude substitution unless you're about Hebrews and Paul. Well, and, and right, and and because <clears throat> yes, it's there. It is absolutely there. And on the other hand, if you emphasize substitution too much, then you end up with, uh, and you better watch out. Santa, Santa's coming to town. <laughs> well, I mean, the, it, it's the, the Calvinism, the substitutionary atonement of the reformers, that, which was really heavily penal, uh, is, I think, where mainstream evangelical Christianity in the United States is hung up. That they're just they're stuck on that as the only real explanation or description of what Christ accomplished on the cross. And if they could get a little this Christ, Christus Victor into their blood, they might see that well, there, there's a lot of love here too. Um, all right. <clears throat> The other thing, the other thing, from my from, as an as an evangelical, Christus Victor was enlightening to me because it does a better job, I think, than the substitutionary atonement of taking the whole of Christ's life into account. The incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension are all necessary. In, not that they aren't in evangelicalism, don't get me wrong, but in the substitutionary model, the emphasis is on the cross. And exhibit one, I would point to our go look at evangelical hymns for Christmas or Advent. And they're kind of, mm. but for Easter, Good Friday, yeah, the cross, baby, the cross. Uh, and there's something about substitutionary atonement that sort of says, well, okay, yeah, Jesus lived. <laughs> he, he was born uh, of the Virgin Mary, but the really important part is that he suffered and died and rose from the dead. <clears throat> Christus Victor, on the other hand, it, it, it says, look at his life and everything about his life is a foreshadowing of what happens on the cross. It's all part of the same stuff. All right, gotta stop. Now I really have to stop.